great. All right, thanks everybody for joining. This is episode 17 of The Art of Law. On this episode, we will, this is a special two-parter, Mark, uh, negotiating with Chinese parties. And I think we have a pretty action-packed episode today. So uh, maybe we should just get, get to it then. Yep, sure. Uh, as usual, just a little bit of house cleaning. Uh, everyone who is watching does get, I will send them a copy of the, the presentation later with the link to the YouTube video as well. Um, and on the presentation right over on your screen right here is a link to the YouTube channel just in case uh, you, know, you lose it or something like that. And we encourage questions. So if you have any questions, just put in the chat. I per periodically look at them and I try to get them uh, to mark at the appropriate section. So yeah, just leave it in the chat. And um, as we do like to do in the Art of Law series, Mark, we kind of like to, uh, before we delve into like the meat of the topic, just hear a little bit about your experience because you've been working in China for so long, uh, 27 years, I guess. Um, and, and this, <laughs> and this I thought I could. I muted everybody. All right. So, um, so uh, as we like to do, uh, <laughs> um, I like to I like to pick your brain on how, and especially on this topic, uh, is in particular is a little bit interesting because how did negotiations change, uh, or have they? Uh, from the time when you first started practicing in China to, I mean, even today, Mark? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, 25 years ago, you know, we had more kind of negotiations. They were tougher. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I think nowadays um, probably lawyers are less involved than in the old days uh, with negotiations because we were even involved in negotiations for supply contracts and things like that. So I think now, you know, the parties will do a lot more of the negotiations together. Um, and then, you know, we will often only be, you know, um, a step removed, or maybe one of our lawyers will attend uh, when they're finalizing the contracts. So it used to be that, you know, there'd be days and hours of negotiating, everybody sitting in a room together, yeah, maybe it's happening without me now, uh, without our team. But I don't think it happens like that anymore. I think, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's easier to negotiate things than it used to be. And when you came, was, <laughs> was there an internet, Mark? Or how did that, how no, was that? Well, I don't know if there was an internet. Um, I, I, I remember the, like the first job, I think there probably wasn't an internet uh, but then when I started working at the German law firm, that would have been in 1995. I remember that we, the way we got the internet was we'd have to use like a, um, a landline to dial into Hong Kong. And once I forgot to turn off the landline on a Friday. And so it was like a three day phone call to Hong Kong. So they weren't very happy about that. And it was, uh, it was these two hands would shake. It would be making that noise. I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. block made from that noise like yeah, da, do, and it would like, two hands would shake hands, and it was like success, and you felt kind of excited about it. Um, and I remember we were using Netscape, which was you know, and, and, you know, and for some reason I, I remember the first thing I downloaded, it was like a, I wanted to see if you could download an image. For some reason, the image was a man of a beard. And it took like three hours to download this, you know, it was just so slow. But yeah, uh, yeah I guess we used a lot in the early days, we we're using fax a lot. And then we would go to negotiate things. You know, if you're in second or third tier cities, uh, sometimes they had the weirdest printers, you know, they had these weird printers. And, you know, even, you know, you know, it was very slow to print stuff. So we used to have a printer, yeah, which was a pretty good one. But you know, if you have those big contracts and you sometimes needed 12 of those contracts, you'd be up to, you know, it'd be me often, 
up till two o'clock at night printing everything, checking the documents. <laughs> Uh, and so I guess all that stuff now, you know, probably like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you have those copy shops. And so when we have those things, we just outsource it to them to print everything. So, you know, it's just somehow easier. But what about the actual, I, because the, the, the theme that we're going to get into in a little bit is, I guess, the strategy and the preparation that goes into entering a negotiation, you know, how, do you think that aspect of negotiating negotiating has changed as much, you know, in contrast to the technology the technology part? Probably not, but just want to get your thoughts. Yeah, I think, like I said, I think um, you know, early on there was uh, such a major difference. Like you know, the Chinese companies often had never been involved with a foreign company. The foreign companies had never been involved in China, and so I think that added a lot of, um, you know, fear or concerns. And, you know, so foreigners would come with very ridiculous contracts. I think foreigners still do that. And then Chinese companies would have, you know, very one-sided contracts or very short contracts. It was just so difficult. I think now uh, probably the Chinese contracts generally are longer. They're more, you know, similar. And maybe the foreign side yeah, of course, there's always the differences, but there's sometimes a little bit more. Yeah, sometimes you felt like the foreign contracts were written in a style to make it impossible to negotiate. You know, like, um, you know, anything which was sensitive, you know, they would put in bold and capitals and underlying, you know, just to really make sure the Chinese would notice those causes. So I think um, things are much easier than they used to be. Yeah, maybe yeah. if you go to some yeah. fifth tier city, you can still have fun with somebody, but uh, yeah, it's not like it used to be. I don't think. And uh, the second question here, we'll say for the second episode, actually, um, how is the law and legal remedies and uh, how how's that evolved over time? Uh, in the second episode, we'll get a little bit more into the actual um, finalizing the contracts, you know, more of the, the more late stage uh, parts of the negotiation. But for today, um, We'll start off with the strategic preparation. And Mark, I think that this, uh, you know, usually for some of these uh, presentations, Mark and I kind of split the work, but Mark took a lot of the heavy lifting for this, for this one, because I, you know, he has a lot more experience in um, kind of identifying trends using leveraging his, uh, his knowledge. Um, so we're just going to start off with, I guess, some of the trends that you've seen here. And, and the first one is kind of like the life cycle of a partnership, the preparation to the operation, to the exit, and how negotiations, uh, what is the role of negotiation in each of those stages? Right, so so I think, you know, it's important. So this what, slide, and maybe these slides aren't all gonna be in the right order because it's the first time we've done this. But I think, you know, before you start, I mean, we'll probably use the word JV mostly because that's easier shorthand, but it could be an m and And I think what you're seeing is, yeah, we didn't have that many deals in the last 12 months, uh, like those kind of deals. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is even though, you know, I read an interesting article by Robert Dowd a few days ago about how m and is booming. And I know now, you know, um, German office PE is booming at the moment. Australian uh, m and is booming at the moment. But I think in China, as we're doing cross-border m and you know, it's difficult for people to do joint ventures or m a if they can't physically meet which maybe should have been a point you know, in that last slide with the zoom call i think you can only do so much you know we've got a few projects at the moment and i just don't know how we're going to actually bring them forward if people can't physically meet you know, so uh yeah we've got two like that we did one earlier this year but the you know the foreign company did have a senior manager in China who could negotiate. But if it's really, you know, the foreign team is overseas, very difficult. But anyway, uh, before you start the negotiations, you know, it's probably good to think a bit about how it's going to end. And so I think, you know, in the preparation stage, you know, when you're looking at the life cycle, you know, finding the right partner, and I know I say that a lot, but, you know, better to have the right partner than the right contract, you know, best is to have both. But you really, I think that's the first thing. How do you align? And I think there's a lot more, it's a much more complicated thing than it used to be. 
It used to be that foreigners would just pick the wrong partner or they would pick a partner when they didn't need a partner. And now I think the difference is for many, many different reasons, uh, primarily that China as a marketplace is very interesting, but it's also very big and it's very dynamic. You know, a lot of foreign companies, especially technology heavy companies, probably will have to roll out with a joint venture partner, not because they need to by law, just because it's the only way to be meaningful. You know, so if you're not a very small niche um, uh, product or service, you might need to have a joint venture to be very successful in China. So, and a lot of those partners, I think I read this morning, Tencent uh, acquired a games company. I don't know if they were Chinese or foreign games companies. They, on average, I think it was every three days uh, last year. So, you know, a lot of the Chinese companies that people are dealing with, they're very professional. They know, you know, what is possible. So then I think the second issue is knowing what is and what is not a deal breaker. And I think nowadays it's for both sides. So sometimes the Chinese side might have very unrealistic views about, you know, what's possible. They might want all of the technology to be transferred to China. The foreign partner might equally have unrealistic views. You know, like they might say, we'll only give you a license, but we want to be able to IPO. And that might be very complicated. So I think, you know, these are not things we can give a list, but really what is a deal breaker? What's not a deal breaker? Very often, especially US companies, uh, who've got compliance concerns, you know, sometimes things, and we talk a bit about it later, there are things which are non-compliant, but not a big issue. Um, yeah. And you have to know what is the deal breaker. And then I think, you know, due diligence, what are you looking for? And, you know, using this to prepare your detailed negotiation strategy. So I think that's the main points on the, pre on the um, you know, the preparation. Um, just quickly, yeah, sorry. No, uh, we'll focus mostly on this, uh, this preparation part for this section and for episodes, uh, the, the, the next episode, when we start talking more about the you know, operation and, and exit, I guess. But um, I, I, think, I think one of the things that I've heard you mention before, but you, you didn't uh, mention it during the, um, the, the, the changing China slide that, that we usually do is um, that Chinese partners or working with Chinese partners has uh, Chinese parties have become more um, sophisticated and more experienced than 27 years ago when you started, you know, what your practice in, in China. So yeah, in a way, it, uh, it is, um, it is even more important to find the right partner, but also it's getting a little bit tougher because the right, the right partner is it's not the one that's you need the right one, not the right now one. And I, I think that you know it's uh it's a, it's very different um, today trying to do that than it was 27 years ago when you uh, or 15 years ago when you wrote that book. Um, this slide right here is um you know whether regardless of the time frame I guess uh, Mark I, I, uh, the the DNA the characteristics of a successful partnership do tend to have some similarities amongst each other. Uh, uh, and these are some of the ones that you've identified. Uh, you wanna walk <laughs> us through this? Yeah, so I think firstly is that alignment of strategic objectives. So like 15 or 20 years ago, the, the most common joint ventures we did 20 years ago were suppliers for the auto industry. And, you know, they, yeah, auto industry was a B2B business. Um, you know, you were selling to, a limited number of manufacturers and probably yeah, the joint ventures that we worked on uh, were mostly people selling to Volkswagen or you know, BMW or one of the big German companies or General Motors joint ventures. So yeah, that was just you know, by, by the weight of numbers. And I think you know, in many of those cases, probably the joint venture wasn't as necessary as people thought. You know, a lot of people did joint ventures because they thought, or we don't understand the market, uh, you know, the Chinese partner will have the factory, the land, he's got the connections to SAIC and all these kind of things. I don't know. You know, a lot of those got turned into wholly foreign owned enterprises, but I think now it's a bit different. So, you know, a lot of the activity that we see 
it's not really in you know traditional automotive it might be in something like um you know autonomous car related technology you know or you know people looking at healthcare or you know and almost all of them i think really most of the products we see now most of the projects we see now there is always a very clear fixation on the chinese market and so the question is how do you align the strategic objective and you know that's tougher than it sounds so you know sometimes people will make fun of you because you might be doing a joint venture with someone who's clearly your competitor but then they also make fun of you if you're doing a joint venture with somebody that has absolutely no connection to your business so it's a bit difficult you have to really think about it and you know there's been many joint ventures which were agreed by the high level management of the chinese and the 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 foreign company but they didn't do anything because they didn't really have a detailed idea what they're going to do together and so basically they set up companies that competed with themselves and nobody really put in effort so i think that's the first one um the second one is this meaning of minds with respect to the china context and i think we got a slide a bit later about giving up a little bit of control you know i think you know increasingly i think what we're going to see is that a lot of international companies will have to give up a little bit and let the chinese company if they've picked the right chinese partner and they manage to keep themselves you know still you know uh, relevant you know you've got to think about how china fits in and i think where a lot of people will come down is that the foreign company will control its brand and technology or you know especially the technology and brand in its home markets and possibly the west but maybe china will have exclusivity for china and maybe it will extend to greater china and i'm guessing it may well extend to southeast asia as well so i think you know we're going to see these geographical uh, kind of issues and for a lot of companies they may feel asia's too big for them to do by themselves but the chinese you know if it's a trusted partner they can probably do a better job in southeast asia which has got 500 million people you've got china with 1.4 you know billion that's 2 billion people you know that's a lot of people to deal with so you know i can imagine american or european companies might be just saying well let the chinese deal with their geography we'll we'll look after you know the west um and then i think you know proactive stakeholder management is important yeah it really will depend on you know you can't say exactly but you know you know if you're in a very sensitive area that's about talking to the authorities um it's you know you know if you're in something very data heavy and very restricted you might you might actually want a state owned you know a uh, company as your partner um you know you might be looking for subsidies from the local government and so you know you, i mean maybe you want to keep the employees you're taking over happy so i think you know it's you know often these kind of partnerships when you're thinking about your negotiations you have to also think not just about who's on the table with you but other people like the local government you know the soes but also the employees you know the the management there's lots of different people you know running around and um well just for that i want to go back to this stuff for a second because i think that what you talked about is almost uh completely different than you know how how it it seems it was you know 27 years ago 15 years ago um because it seems like it's not necessarily out of necessity this is a lot this is very much strategic thinking and um and like you said really based on a mistake you know i think um if you had like a german supplier to vw and then vw was setting up in china and the joint venture was successful and you know one of the things to make it more successful was to localize production and then for someone like vw yeah they can't just localize their own production uh they needed their suppliers to come and of course the law also had local content back then and all these kind of things but you know despite the law i think people felt they had to come to this big market uh but yeah you know, the chinese back in those days were always talking about export oriented stuff about technology transfers and all this kind of stuff um 
I don't, and I think the foreigners were coming in order to get the market, but they weren't so clear. I think a lot of those suppliers could have easily have done wholly foreign owned enterprises and it would have been simpler for them because they only had a few customers. But I think if you want to do, you know, I don't know, if you want to do COVID test centers in China or something, you're going to need a Chinese partner just to deal with all the requirements of having a mass business in China in a sensitive area, which would be highly regulated. You know, I think that's yeah. the difference. Yeah. And I think um, um, it is very context dependent. And even though, you know, it, it you can get into the, the, the details, uh, we did try to put a little bit of a checklist on some of the things to keep in mind when you're juggling all of these, uh, <laughs> all of these different issues. And there's one in the uh, chat also, and it, it is also one of these issues that you have to juggle, um, but alignment, government implementation, um, maybe Mark, we'll start off with, I want to, maybe we'll start off with uh, the question in the chat. It's not really a question, it's more of a, a comment, but I think it goes into the whole uh, theme here of, uh, you know, juggling everything. You, you mentioned before that, you know, it, it might be sector dependent, but in the, Cyrus in the chat uh, says, at the local government and SOE level, discussions are driven by policies coming from Beijing. These can be localized, but it makes sense to do your industry background homework too. I think, um, I think the you know another interesting dynamic is, of course, this local government SOE, like you mentioned, um, you know, uh, uh, provincial policies, national policies, you know, these types of things. So um, that might be one of the things that I think that'll be one of the things that we get into a little bit later. But Mark, if you had anything you wanted to, to add on to that, otherwise, I'd uh, like to hear your thoughts on the, the checklist we prepared here too. Yeah, so I think with state-owned enterprises, you know, even though that might be growing, you know, we don't do that many of them because there's less of those bonds. They can be a very big joint venture. We've got the one at the moment, which we're trying to extract ourselves from a joint venture, state-owned enterprise. And yet one of the interesting dynamics is that's an old company. That's probably been around for 15 years or something. Uh, but in that case, you know, the state-owned enterprise has been restructured and, you know, um, the joint venture is a little bit of an orphan, you know, it's a bit, you know, and so there, it's a bit like what Cyrus was saying, there are policies from higher levels, and I guess that's one of the issues. We've got a project that's really taking forever as well. That's where the state-owned enterprise just is listed. And one of the big issues there was, who is the joint venture partner? Is it the listed vehicle? Is it this other vehicle? You know, we tend to say, go with the biggest you can get. You know, so if you're dealing, you know, the, the top co is normally the best, but that's not always possible. So yeah, there are those kind of issues you have to even think about, which we didn't mention here, but I think it comes from the point that was just made. And maybe Mark, just you want to run through very quickly some of these uh, other strategic parts. Um, I, I do want to get to the rest of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So I think, look, I mean, early on, you have to work out what do you want to do? What's the joint venture going to do? There's often then overlap with existing businesses in China. How do you deal with that? Who's responsible for what? Um, how is there a mutual benefit? Because I think this is a question that very rarely is asked. You know, people uh, don't really think about the mutual benefit. Why are we here? What is the strategic purpose? That's really a question, I think, for the international company. And then I think normally people will have to think a bit about governance, which I know is a boring word, uh, but I think it's very you know, insightful because yeah, I think there's growing numbers of companies that will let the Chinese do the heavy lifting and the Chinese partners should run it, but there should be some kind of safeguards. And so I think you know, the responsibilities, what's the management structure, how will voting and decisions be made these are all important things that the international company has to grapple with because it might be it's better to be a successful shareholder with 10% or 20% in a joint venture rather than have 70% of an unsuccessful joint venture. And it may be that as long as the business is contained within China and maybe your brand's not even being used, you may wish to let the Chinese partner have more of the decision-making power, but what are your vital concerns and how do you deal with it? And then I think, you know, implementation, do you have the right people to look out for you? You can have a great contract and say, I can do this and this, 
But if you actually have somebody who can do that job for you and, you know, are the things that we agree in the contract operationally sensible? And then yeah, cross-cultural issues, I used to think it was bogus until I, you know, lived overseas now. I mean, I left China, you know, in 2018 uh, and, you know, for a year I've been away from China and I kind of realise now there really are a lot of different cultural issues. So that has to be addressed as well. And I just want to highlight that. It's, it, each one of these is probably um, individually, you know, it's kind of important, but when you take it all in, in uh, together, um, it, each one of them is kind of like this, you know, uh, this play diagram here where each part, the, it's the synergy, right? The, the, the sum is greater than the, the pieces. So um, it is it is important to keep not all of not one of these, especially at the front of mind, but probably all of them. But I think it's uh, not the synergy. To tell you the truth, it's more the armor, the weakness in the armor. I think any of those things can destroy the beautiful plan. You know, so it's not really like oh, I've put these together; it's better. It's more like if you have a weakness somewhere, that can you know topple the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> And so we wanted to put together some pitfalls to look out for. So maybe Mark, you can take this yeah, one. I'll just go through it very quickly. You know, Guan Shi, look, you know, I've rarely seen it. Yeah, increasing irrelevant might be unfair. It's important, but you have to understand if it's real. And, you know, I think nowadays it's not that often that they'll get the contracts where I think Guan Shi is more important is if it's something like handling sensitive data does your partner know how to do it? Does it have good relationships with the regulator that you get the operational licenses, et cetera, et cetera. You know, control of finances, or at least, you know, maybe not control if you're in a minority, but at least oversight or, you know, knowledge. You know, we have a joint venture at the moment. I'm pretty sure they have no idea what's happened in the last 10 years you know, anywhere financially. Realistic expectations, I think that's also important. You know, China is very dynamic and quick, but you know, it's not gonna be normally quick success, it takes time. And then like providing training, injecting company culture, you know, making sure you have enough resources in there. And then I think, um, you know, getting the right people in there. And so I think this is all, yeah, if you're gonna do it, you should do it seriously. And this might be an old slide where we're talking about really uh, the joint ventures where the China, where the foreign side had 70%. Yeah, in our new world, we may need to work out how you secure your interest in a 25% joint venture, for example. And uh, there are many different types of stakeholders, uh, and, and especially if you're dealing with, for example, like a uh, state-owned company, then it's, you know, it gets a little bit more complicated uh, the layers of who are you talking to really, you know, who is the decision maker and who, is, who, who are the stakeholders that are important to that decision maker. And it can go from the state-owned companies all the way down to um, just private enterprises, but everybody, uh, you know, we, you, we wrote here that business is just more than just structures and companies. There's a lot of real people with real interests involved. And um, this, this diagram, Mark, I guess, is just kind of highlights some of the um, some of the common stakeholders that we we often have to consider. Yeah, I think the uh, it looks a bit seventies that uh, or eighties the, uh, the, uh, the the diagram. So I think you know look, we we did a deal uh, recently which was not one of those high tech deals. It was an agriculture deal, and the main reason was the operational licenses, the existing business uh, to get a stake a foothold in the market. Yeah, but in that case, we couldn't really do an asset deal, which I don't like anyway, which we've discussed previously. Uh, but, you know, this company was heavily in debt. So we could talk to the owner, but really the owner, you know, not talking to the banks would have made it impossible. So we had to talk to the banks. And then the local authorities were the people that also, you know, they have an interest in that business continuing, so they help us to also talk to the banks. And then suppliers, because the business was very um, under pressure. Well, would the suppliers continue to supply us? Otherwise, we'd have a factory and everything, but nothing to process. 
And I think customers in that case was less of a problem. Uh, management, owner, workers, they were less of a problem in that particular case. But I think this is the kind of idea, before you start talking to the Chinese partner, you have to also think of the people who are behind uh, him or her. And so I understand the T-bone stake. So that's a guy holding a stake. I don't know what these ribs are. I don't know what that, that I don't understand that uh, photo. But, but yeah, I think you have to look beyond just the person at the table with you. You have to think a bit about, you know, these other issues as well. Yeah. So I have a question here from Manchu because I, I wanted to wait until we covered this, this part. Um, Ashu asked, how do you ensure that the right people are at the negotiation table? It seems initially that people are able to take decisions, but it later turns out that other stakeholders, maybe some authority or, or other board members who have been involved, who have not yet been involved in discussions are sometimes the ones actually calling the shots. So, um, you know, how, how do you, uh, I guess, in the preparation stages, you know, try to... Um, consider this issue, Mark? Yeah, well, it's a very messy one. I think we'd cover that a bit in the next one uh, because we're talking really more about the actual negotiation. Uh, but yeah, very shortly, the yeah, one of the great old stories about doing you know, deals in China is that the decision maker, the more traditional the company, the less likely the decision maker is to be there. Uh, I think nowadays, if you're dealing with a private enterprise, and they actually like your company and they're really interested, the decision maker will turn up and he'll make decisions quickly. But, you know, in the old days, uh, and probably now also with state-owned enterprises or, you know, companies that are bigger and they may not be as excited as you are about the thing, they will often have the decision maker behind. And for that reason, sometimes you don't want to bring your decision maker either. And so you kind of have like... Uh, intermediaries you know they're your team uh, but that's an old Chinese trick where they agree at the table and they say yeah but Mr. Wang has just disagreed so we can't do that or and sometimes they blame the authorities but then you go to the authorities they say oh we don't care uh, so yeah there's, there's those kind of tricks we can discuss next time I think you know if we're talking about the banks or whatever during the due diligence it'll become apparent that you're going to have to talk to the banks and you know that's something you're going to have to you know just deal with the guy Obviously, you don't go and talk to the banks in detail without you know, telling your Chinese counterpart. So that example you were talking about with the, the JV who was like uh, in, in massive debt, it, was it, I guess it was pretty apparent that the banks were one of the um, stake, important stakeholders to consider? Yeah, I think after five minutes, it was, uh, it was uh, obvious. And it was also the main reason he was selling was because he didn't want the banks to cut his head off and put it on a stick and run around the streets with it. So, you know, I mean, it was obviously a distressed company. So then obviously you know, the banks have to be discussed. So I've been getting a couple of questions on finding the right partner. So let's just jump into this. Finding the right partner is somewhat difficult. I don't know out of these, out of, out of this crowd here, I don't know which one will probably be the best for you, but Mark, you like this one, I guess. Well, I think the thing was, this was in the Daily Mail, and I just thought, what a great photo, because uh, it's one of those games where you had to, like, find who's, where's Waldo or whatever, but it had a panda uh, amongst a bunch of snowmen, so I thought, I, I've got to take a photo of this just to keep it for some future use, so I think it's quite useful. <laughs> so, so I think there's lots of wrong partners. I think um, you've got to find the right partner. I think, yeah, one of the problems is a lot of people – they know three companies in China and everybody wants to do a joint venture with uh, Alibaba or Tencent, uh, um, you know, or these kind of uh, people. But really, yeah, 99.999% of companies in China are not those two. And they're nice, but, you know, are you going to be of interest to them? It's difficult. So I think for most people, we're talking about different companies. So I think, you know, when you look at it, Firstly, work out, do you need a partner legally um, or what kind of partner you need? If you're in the financial services business, you know, it might be quite limited what kind of partner. But even in China, you know, because of the size of the country, even limited probably means instead of you know, uh, 500 million potential partners, maybe you're limited to 10,000 or something. You know? So I think you know, work that out. What's the benefit? What's the reason for it? 
Uh, do you trust them? Look, the joint ventures we've seen or the M&As which have worked the best are where there was a relationship. So, you know, this also is what works best for the Chinese is if they know the company for a number of years, it's much easier than, you know, a cold start. But, you know, sometimes you have to do it uh, and some of those are also successful. And so what's their motivation? And I think something which people never discuss, or at least I've never seen it discussed unless I bring it up with the client, is if you're doing it with a private enterprise uh, and the, the person who founded the company and runs the company, if he's in his 60s, who's going to run the company after he goes away? So these are some of the selection criteria to think about. And since we're on the topic, um, I have a, uh, a question here from, from, uh, from Jim. Uh, outside of third-party introductions, what other platforms or avenues are effective for identifying potential JV partners? I know that you, uh, from from uh, previous episodes, I know that I know that we've uh, introduced ideas of um, potentially trying to partner. If you're a technology company, for example, looking at the star market as one avenue for finding, try to find some introductions and some parties who might be interested in, in your technology and, and partnering up in China or even abroad. Um, but, uh, and you also mentioned, Mark, that uh, a lot of the successful ones that you've seen are coming from some type of previous relationship. Was it, it do you mean like a, some type of like uh, dis distributor relationship or supply relationship? How does that? Yeah. So I think, look, look probably most of them, yeah, you know, if it's a traditional business, it will be something like that. So we're doing, Something at the moment, it's very early, but a recently listed IPO company in the agri space is looking to buy a European company where most of its business is China-based. And I think the reason that they really are interested in this European company is because they've been doing business with that European company for 20 years. They've done an IPO now. Their whole business focus is China. And so you know, they've got a trusted, you know, European supplier that they've worked with for 20 years. That's quite, you know, special for a Chinese company. I think, yeah, I would imagine that is a very, you know, attractive target for a recently IPO'd Chinese company and, you know, looking to maybe use that European company, strangely enough, not for their China business, which I'm sure is good, but to maybe even use them to become their European arm and help expand that way. So I think those kind of things are the best. Uh, you know, there's governments, whatever country you're from, you know, I guess if not if you're from something like you know, Afghanistan or something, but you know, most people watching, you know, you know, if you're German or British or American, there would be government uh, you know, bodies that can help you know, make connections or, there's people like the China British Council or the German Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. I'm sure those guys would have a circle. Um, it's maybe a bit hit and miss always. Uh, and I think something which we've seen in the last few years is that there are these um, people, I don't want to use the word consultants, uh, but especially in the technology space, uh, we're working with one which is based in Germany, another one based in Shanghai, uh, which does a lot with America. But what these guys do is they identify companies and they um, can you know, put you in touch with the right company and some of them only make money or they might do it as sweat equity. So I mean, that could be another discussion. I know that you just sent me a message that we have to move. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff people do. And I think that um, possibly one of the considerations on who would be a good partner is also to figure out, okay, well, what does that partner, what is that partner looking for? And what are the challenges that they face? And I know this slide is talking more so from a very, you know, a, a more general um, perspective, but uh, you should definitely take your, your industry and your sector into consideration as well, as well as, you know, what can you offer not only in China, like you, like you mentioned, Mark, but also what you can offer, um, in your home market. So Mark, this is, this is some, of the, um, some of the thoughts that you've had of what are the challenges of dealing with foreigners you know, that, that Chinese parties uh, face? Because you know, likewise, you know, this goes, it goes both ways, right? So dealing with um, your Chinese partner is, can be quite uh, you know, mysterious to, to some, but also 
let's consider what are the challenges of dealing with foreign partners. So I think I, I did this slide. I'm going to have to work on this slide because I think it's interesting and we should improve on it. But yeah, I, I always saw so many people talking about, oh, Chinese partners are so difficult like this, so difficult like this, or this is the peculiarity. And I thought, well, I've never seen a slide talking about why foreigners are difficult to deal with. And so I think, you know, one thing is, you know, especially for like, say, Europeans, where they, you know, I think for the Chinese, it's very hard to often work out who's in charge of the negotiations because it's so egalitarian and the workflow is often so disjointed. Most cases, especially with a privately owned company in China, you know who the decision maker is and, you know, he'll, it's typically a man as well, he'll come in and he'll just say, yes, no, yes, no, and it's, yeah, it's all over. Uh, whereas I guess if you're dealing with you know, a bunch of Europeans, it could be, you know, Mr. Schmidt's in charge of that aspect. You know, uh, Mr. Um, you know, Fart is in charge of that aspect. It can be very confusing for the Chinese. And sometimes just the strong hierarchy makes things go quicker and more certain. <clears throat> also, you know, is it the team in front of you in charge? Is it the head office in charge? Is it the finance guy in charge? And so often, you know, you think you've got a decision made by the local team, you know, who represent the foreign company, then it might go to the financial department, the CFO, and you think you've got a decision, but then you don't realize there's some tax advisor who can trump everybody. He can trump, um, you know, implementation. He can trump um, what makes sense to operationally. He can trump what makes sense financially because he's the magic tax advisor. So I think very often, Chinese companies find it very puzzling how things come from the side. <clears throat> Europeans or, you know, Americans also resistant to organizational change. So they just really find it difficult to think that the Chinese side might have a good idea. You know, it's like, well, we do it this way. You should do it this way. Yeah, but it's in China. Yeah, I know, but, you know, we do it this way. So, yeah, come on, do it our way. And then very often the, you know, the foreign people they might be totally unfamiliar with working with people outside of their own region, much less China. And it's important for them to be a bit open-minded because all because it's someone else's idea and it's different from yours, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. You know? So I think they're the kind of challenges we sometimes see with foreigners. And we alluded to this earlier. <laughs> giving up control <laughs> can also be one of those, uh, you know, really difficult things, especially if it's a, you know, private company and this is kind of your baby. So uh, what are your thoughts on giving up control? I think you gotta find the right partner. If you've got the right partner and it's complex, it will depend. If you really wanna penetrate the Chinese market, if there are things, you know, you know, I'll give you a quick example. We talked to a company, they didn't become a client. I think they're far away from the China market. They have an interesting technology which is like filtration systems or air quality monitors, but it feeds into the infrastructure. So it will divert traffic. It may change how production is done within a city. And the idea is rather than having hotspots of high pollution, you can ease it out over the whole day or in certain geographical areas. They've done it in, I think, six cities in Europe, but that kind of company, they could become a consultant in China, but they could never roll out in China. You know, so I think that would be where you'd have to find a strong partner. And instead of finding six cities in Europe, you might find a partner who can do 60 cities with 10 times the amount of people and, you know, roll it out in China. But you will not be able to do that from Europe. You know, it's too difficult. And so I think there, look at your real concerns and then let them drive and you know, that's perhaps what the idea is behind that. Great. Guys, any questions, just any leave questions. it in the chat. Um, I know that there's a, this is a pretty dense topic, so um, do let us know. Um, after all, this, all of that is you know, complete, <laughs> that's quite a lot to be honest, Mark, but when we are starting to um, formalize you know, all, of these, all of these ideas and thoughts, um, the letter of intent is probably the first uh, hard copy of, you know, 
documenting all of these all of these um, discussions. So maybe just very quickly, we only have one slide on this, but um, it is a, it is a very important concept. Um, the letter of intent, Mark. Yeah, so I wouldn't get too bent out of shape about it. I think the letter of intent, really, it's to show uh, to both parties it makes sense, you know, because if nobody signs anything, and it can be difficult if it's a listed company, because even if they sign a letter of intent, they might need to disclose it. So, yeah, that could be where you wouldn't sign it. But, Bree, the LOI, firstly, well, let's say it's the typical case where the foreign partner wants to do a joint venture on M&A in China. You probably won't get access to the due diligence until you've signed an LOI. Um, and I think for the foreign company, normally the less said, the better, because all you want is access to the due diligence. But things might be project description. You might just want to know roughly the shareholding structure. Am I majority? Am I minority? Am I 80%? You know, just something. <clears throat> Government structure, who's running what? Valuation, if the Chinese partner is contributing assets or you're buying them or whatever, you know, just you don't want to like start getting lawyers involved in doing due diligence and you find out that the Chinese view of their business is 10 times what you think it's worth. Yeah, and then maybe a timeline and maybe project exclusivity, but sometimes the Chinese partner might seek a deposit. So sometimes that clause I sometimes will drop. So I think the letter of intent, normally, the less said, the better, uh, if you're the foreign company. And for the next episode, we will get into the term sheet and some of the more, um, I guess, legally binding uh, documents. And this slide right here, before we jump into the next section on due diligence, is, uh, kind of echoes what you said earlier, Mark, that some aspects, uh, you know, when you're considering letter of intent and all of these other uh, concepts, you know, we just put here some of the non-critical items or items which, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a deal breaker. So uh, again, we'll send this uh, copy of the presentation to everybody who registered for the, for the webinar. All right. So uh, due diligence, Mark, we, uh, well, this was your idea to, to put this yeah. slide. Well, I have an old slide, but I remember I just did it because somebody before I gave the, the, the speech, he said, oh, are you one of those lawyers that's a deal killer? And, um, you know, so I thought it was funny. I put it in the thing. And then I remember that speech because uh, he, uh, he asked it. And I said, you know, the biggest problem was I didn't kill enough deals, you know. So I think, you know, I think lawyers can be bad. They can, for those previous list of things, yeah, lawyers can just look at things in such a theoretical way. They can kill good deals. Uh, by just putting up barriers where there are no barriers, you know, where it's not really such a big problem. But then the other thing they can do is they can make it so well protected, uh, the closing, for example, that by the end of the negotiation, the two partners who liked each other at the start hate each other at the <laughs> end. So, you know, I think the due diligence, you have to be a little bit um, reasonable, you know? So why should people do due diligence, Mark? Well, I think you need to do it because, you know, firstly, it's a good way to really understand the target. Uh, you know, you need to do it if you want to have the contracts make sense. And also, you know, it would have a valuation effect and also a safeguard effect. But, you know, I think it's not always just about the contract. It's about understanding the business and also understanding if that Chinese partner can actually do what they say they can do and whether their company is what they say it is. Very quick on that, just had a case a few weeks ago. It reminded me so much of a case we had a few years ago where a European company said to us, we've got this opportunity to buy this fantastic company. It has a trading license. Uh, we think it's, you know, they told us, you know, it's normally worth 10 million euros, but we could buy it for 8 million euros. The owner is a Taiwanese company. They've got great relationships. So they've got that trading company. Yeah. Fast forward 10 years later, American company tells me the same story. Uh, both companies were Weigao Chow trading companies. You could set them up with a hundred thousand US dollar investment and uh, you know, do it in three months. So, you know, you know, sometimes you have to have a reality check as to what you're really buying. And so uh, we have a 
separate okay. episode on due diligence, so we won't spend too much time on you know some of some of the specifics here. But in addition to, but what, one of the things we didn't in, uh, cover in the in the other episode was um, due diligence as a tool to dealing with for dealing with uh, headquarters. Mark, yeah. what do you what are you getting at here? Well, I think the problem is there is often you know the global CEO before they come to China they say it's very risky, it's very risky to move quickly. Everything has to be 100% compliant. Yeah, there's not much we can do in China. And then they come on a trip to China, and they haven't left, you know, immigration, and they've become crazy and of, of um, they become um, what's the word? Drunk, um, intoxicated with the action, the dynamic. Why are we so late? We need 100% growth. We can do anything. And so I think due diligence. It's weird. It can help on the one hand the global CEO who hasn't come over to say, well, look, it's not fully compliant, but it's not a big problem. This is how we're going to deal with it, you know, et cetera. But then it can also be a protection that you say to headquarters, well, look, this is an issue. This is an issue. This is an issue. Uh, yeah. Not that you yeah. get hoisted on the petard, you know, and say it's you know, your fault. So I think due diligence is also to deal with headquarters. So would you say oh, that... Yes. This global CEO after the China trip needs to be more like the statue behind you, more Zen-like. Yeah. yeah, very Zen and quiet and uh, reflective. Yeah, deep thinking. All right, Jack wanted me to mention your your uh, Zen Trump statue. Yes. So when we talk about due diligence, just very generally, um, that there are different types of due diligence, and the the one that we're talking about, uh, you know, in 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 more context is uh, the the legal due diligence, which is carried out by law firms, and it you know gives you um, uh, there's a, a really good snapshot of the legal uh, st structure, the corporate governance. You know, a lot of these, uh, um, a lot of a lot of that uh, um, information. But in addition to that, there's also financial DD, investigatory, and if needed, an environmental DD as well. Uh, Mark, anything you want to say about, you know, these other three types? No, not really. I think, yeah, I mean, I think the financial will be done by an accounting firm. Yeah. Investigatory, they are very inexpensive just to check the background of the people. Obviously, if it's a big listed company, you wouldn't worry. Environmental, those guys always find something. I remember we got a 30-page report because of ammonia leakage. And I knew immediately what it was. It was that the male toilets at the factory uh, you know, didn't have a very good septic tank and it always stunk, but they made it sound like it was going to be Chernobyl or something. So, yeah, I think <laughs> the issue will always be how do you keep a common sense view of things? And this is one of the slides that I didn't touch up, but <laughs> I really like it. I love this flowchart. Yes. <laughs> this flowchart, Mark, fantastic piece of work. Uh, maybe just walk us through it. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't use like a square things. I, I like it. Yeah, but, so I think with DD, I think it's important to understand the project, understand what are the real concerns. And, you know, often lawyers, the problem is they just think of these theoretical legal things. And, you know, when I look at it, um, I want to find out from the client where they think the problems are because clients will understand the business and very often they will know. You know, so we had a business once where we were acquiring a business and the main raw material was gold. And so we would never have thought of all the issues about gold, like, you know, how you can import gold, uh, you know, the VAT on gold, uh, um, breakage on gold, because if you steal a bit of gold, you can steal a lot of money, you know. So, yeah, that's an interesting case where we would never have known. So it's important. And then I think, you know, you look at the strategy paper, you know, what are the operational licenses you need? That's more interesting than whether the company is established. I mean, you know, boy, what a great DD that would be if you say the company doesn't exist. I mean, that's going to be a very short report. So it's mostly things like operational licenses, invoicing, complicated things that trip you up. Field work's important. Like I said, I think, you know, field work, you find out a lot more, especially if you talk to people about sales, if you're worried about procurement fraud or, you know, kickbacks or things like that. And then, you know, we normally do a report. And I think nowadays we mostly do like a red flag report. And very often people don't want the full report unless they just want it for headquarters later. So, you yeah. know, yeah. it used to take up 
you know, three weeks to finalise the report. So now we just give a quick interim report. Very often it's good enough. And we discussed a, a little bit about the field work in, in a previous episode, which I can, uh, in the emails to everybody after this presentation, I can send that to you as well. But we only have six minutes left, Mark. So maybe we just spend the time with um, a very quick case study that you've titled The Obituary. Yes, okay. Yeah, so look, there was a, a business. It was a. It was actually an oil company. Um, they had a good product uh, for the client. It was a good location. Uh, it was actually a foreigner who found the company. Uh, and, you know, May Wenty, so no problems. Next slide. So it was an American company, but, you know, we'll call the company Kwai Si. And, you know, the U.S. company is very excited about it. They negotiated an LOI. They started the due diligence. We did the due diligence, and then we got the results. And so the ownership, the person they were negotiating with is, you know, the Leo family. But when we checked the due diligence, we found that the company was actually owned by a local town government. And the Leo family had a very brief one page, totally unenforceable buyback agreement with the local government. So, you know, the LOI was done with the wrong company. So that was the first problem we noticed. The second note, the problem we noticed was that the client had told us that Kwai Su had the best relationship with the local authorities, which I guess is true on one hand because the local government owned the business. But anyway, they had this excellent uh, connections, but somehow they still managed to be owned by the township, yet be actually sued by the Environmental Protection uh, Bureau for doing pollution. And on top of that, the factory was built on collectively owned agricultural land. So, you know, not land that you could use, you know, for, you know, a factory. They had no building title certificates and the assets didn't belong to the company that owned the company. Those assets belonged to another company. So okay. that was the okay. That's getting... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then the labor force, and I think I might have mentioned this one before because this was really one of the most amazing ones, like, uh, over 200 of the 350 workers were classified as extremely handicapped. Um, so they were extremely handicapped people. And the whole reason why they did all this was because if you were a township enterprise and you had more than 50% of your workforce were handicapped, you could be exempt from VAT tax. So yeah, the problem was that those handicapped people who had the contracts, they existed but none of them actually worked at the factory. All the read employees were employed by yet another party. So, you know, it was kind of weird. So yeah, yeah, this is a number, this is like 10 years ago. And so I don't, you know, I'm not an employment law expert, but I know it's always hard to terminate employees. God knows how you terminate 220 handicapped employees. And so then there were the tax and fees, you know, it wouldn't be a surprise they didn't pay the social contributions, which is kind of normal. The waste discharge fees, yeah, that's kind of normal. But I, I put crosses next to those because um, yeah, they're kind of like normal non-compliance that you can deal with. But the, ta the taxes that were problematic was the enterprise income tax because of the VAT and the customs due because they were smuggling stuff in. But you know, the VAT and enterprise income tax this was just la yeah, massive evasion because they made it a township enterprise and had the handicapped workers all just to avoid those taxes. So I don't know how a foreign company would come in and you know, write the ship. It was just beyond me. Yeah. So this was really the summary. Yeah, the taxes was really three deadheads out of five. The corporate structure, I had to give it five out of five because it seemed like nobody owned anything. It was like the people that were trying to sell it didn't own it. The company, the, the, the township enterprise that owned the company didn't own the assets. The assets were owned by yet somebody else. And then the workforce, I think it was just the affection that I had for the fact that they had hired all these handicapped people, but didn't hire them. And the actual employees were handled by somebody else. 
And then the but compared to those other two, the environmental problem was just you know minimal. And so you know I was just killing myself laughing because this was you know a while back, and people had come uh, to do the deal, and you know it was all a bit of a mad rush. We had given them the initial findings, but they were coming, and so that's why I called it the obituary because I thought this is a story, you know. And so anyway, I gave those findings very similarly to what you know was that. And it was one of the first times in my life I was speechless because the consultant, he just said, but are any of these issues really relevant? We could solve all this by just doing an asset deal. So, you know, sometimes, you know, people surprise you. Yeah, so that was it. I mean, so I think you know, that showed you why field work was very important. You know, you've got to be firm. You've got to check out what's really happening. The Chinese partner is not your enemy, but he's also not your friend. You got to be a bit professional and distance. Uh, I find them very cooperative. You know, in that you know thing, nobody ever tried to really hide anything from us. They just kept on telling us more crazy stuff. So, so you know, I think you get a lot of information if you ask, and yeah, you, know, you can reduce the risk, optimize the legal structure, or maybe just not do it. And this expression here, the Mayo Wenti Wenti Buddha and May Bumfar situation. This is where we often will have it with those consultants where they say, this is all the Chinese partner, Mayo Wenti, this is no problem. Yeah. And then yeah. later you're, you're buying the company and you find out you don't have an operational license. And then the people that told you, this is not a problem, they say, look, Wenti Buddha, the problem's not. Yeah. And then like six months after that, then it's just May Bumfa. There is no solution. <laughs> and so you want to avoid it. I think due diligence helps you avoid falling into that trap. I'd never heard that story before. Um, yeah, and there's no there's no real meeting of the minds, you know, like we talked about. There's no, you know, clear objectives, shared common goals, you know, any of these other things. And um, uh, we're out of time here, but we just put a little bit of teaser of what's going to happen in the, next, uh, in the, next, in the episode. next episode. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. Next episode, we'll talk about the term sheet, the JV contract, and negotiation tactics. That is in two weeks' time. Thank you for um, for watching, and uh, see you on part two. Thanks a lot, Mark, and thanks everybody. Thanks. Sure.